what a lively group. Everybody must be excited about transportation. It's important, important uh, subject, of course. Uh, my name's Tom Branch. I'm the uh, chairman of the Wayne County, uh, what is this, Chamber of Commerce, right? <laughs> uh, some of you, since we're talking about transportation, you know, there's a section of I-40 up around Raleigh called the Tom Bradshaw Highway. That is not me. Uh, that's a more accomplished person than I. Um, I always get a, a little sort of warm feeling when I walk, when I drive by and see the highway, with my name on it. It's not mine, but I'm so happy that it never says Memorial. <laughs> we have several sponsors that I'd like to recognize. If you would please stand up when I uh, introduce you. Our presenting sponsor is the city of Goldsboro. So if you're an elected official or management of Goldsboro City, please stand up so we can recognize you. Thanks, Scott. Scott. Yeah. Where's Chuck go? Scott, thank you. Oh, there you are, Chuck. Um, our gold sponsor is uh, Wayne County. Wayne County, please, uh, elected officials and management, please stand up. Thank you. And our silver sponsor is Corsham Incorporated. Sandy, uh, thank you for being a sponsor. We're Sandy. <laughs> also want to thank Wayne County uh, Economic uh, or, uh, Development Alliance. Thank you so much. They've been very supportive in putting this uh, forum on. Thank you to, the, to that group. The Chamber is pleased to present this forum as one of our signature events. We've had several in the past, uh, one on leadership, one on economic, uh, the economy. Uh, today's forum, of course, is on transportation and certainly a major uh, factor affecting us both locally and from a uh, state level, in both our businesses and our personal lives. Transportation is not static, it's, it's dynamic. It continually evolves in many areas. When I was uh, thinking about this, it reminded me of, of a little history, right up for a little history lesson. And I want to tie it in with, uh, with Tony uh, relative to the Army. Uh, it seems back in 1919, the Army decided that they would try this new technology to see if it was applicable in, uh, in, in the applications of warfare and so forth. It was called the, the vehicle, the uh, trucks and so forth. So in 1919, uh, there was this attempt, which was successful, to go uh, across country. It was called a truck train. They didn't call it a convoy back then, but it was a truck train. And it was put on by the uh, Motor Transport Corps of the United States Army. They left from Washington, D.C., and went all the way to uh, San Francisco. They had to be ferried across the bay, I guess, to get to San Francisco at that time. They went about, um, let's see, 3,250 miles. Uh, departed on July the 7th, uh, again, 1919. They were, again, trying to see if they could use the vehicles as, in the warfare application to transport troops and supplies, very important issue. They had uh, about 230 road incidents, they called it. They stopped for adjustments, extrications, breakdowns, and accidents. They had nine vehicles that didn't make it. Uh, the convoy included 24 expeditionary, uh, expeditionary officers, 15 from the War Department, staff, observation officers, and 258 enlisted men. There was an upstart officer that was a part of this, a young man who was a, back, back then was a brevet lieutenant colonel by the name of Dwight Eisenhower. He was part of the tank corps back then. Um, the convoy broke and repaired 88 wooden bridges, 14 were in Wyoming, and practically all roadways were unpaved from Illinois to Nevada. The convoy logged Again, 3,250 miles. They uh, traveled for 573.5 hours. Anybody do the math on what the average speed was? Just short of six miles an hour. That's what it took uh, back in 1918. That certainly is not the case today. It continues to evolve, and we have what we have today. And, uh, again. Um, that said, let me now introduce uh, 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 now, to introduce our speakers is a man who embraces the importance of transportation reflected in his daily life. When asked about the importance of transportation to the community, he emphatically states, when you're out of transportation, you're out of beer. Chuck out. <laughs> you 
can always count on Tom to get you back, cover your back. But anyway, I just want to take a minute to thank all of you. Transportation equates to commerce, it equates to jobs, and it's so good to see all of you here today. You care about Goldsboro, Wayne County, and more important, this is all about Eastern North Carolina. We all got to survive together. And it's great that you're here to hear what these very knowledgeable speakers have to share with us today. So I do want to take a minute and recognize a few people in the audience. We have our county commissioners and they always travel in pack and they always come in pack and we're very glad to see them here. Very involved so we appreciate y'all being here. And if you will just stand up so everybody can recognize you. I think they, everybody knows you. So I won't call you by name. I also saw our sheriff back there with his entourage to protect him. So we're glad to have them in the house. Um, we have Mr. Gus Tullis. Gus Tullis is our Division IV um, transportation guru, and, and he uh, looks after all of Eastern North Carolina, so we appreciate Gus. We have Mr. Durwood Stevenson. Mr. Durwood is like Mr. North Carolina is what I call him. He knows everybody. He can get anybody on the phone, whether it's wind farms, whether it's Highway 70. He, he helps us with our Highway 70 Commission. But he's just been very, very diligent and always working for um, Eastern North Carolina. So, Mr. Durwood, we're glad to have you here. Uh, most importantly of all this is Miss Ashley sitting beside Mr. Durwood because she put this thing together for us from the Secretary's perspective. So, Ashley, we're glad to have you in Goldsboro and appreciate everything you did to help us with this. And now I'm a little bit, uh, oh, I see our mayor from Mount Olive. I'm sorry, Mr. Ray, I didn't even see you. Mayor from Mount Olive, Ray McDonald, we're glad to have you here. I hope I didn't miss anybody else that snuck in. I, the mayor from Goldsboro was here, but I don't see him. So anyway, and the only other folks that I think it's important to recognize is, is, is from a staff level, the people who work on this every day. We have Jennifer Collins from the city. We have Bobby Croom from the city. He's our traffic engineer, is what I call him. Jennifer's our planner. Uh, I saw Connie Croon, Connie Price in here somewhere. Where's Connie? Connie's our planner from the county. And I saw Chris Pendergraft from Division 4, who's a Division 4. Where's Chris at? I, okay, and Chris is way back there in the back. And he's our Division 4 guy who we go to. And, and they, these folks are working every day for transportation in Wayne County, so we want to thank them. Um, now, I've been long enough, so I'm just going to introduce our first speaker, is Scott Stevens. He's our city manager, and he's been here a while, so you all know him now. There. Well, I do want to thank Chuck for that uh, brief introduction, and uh, it is my pleasure to be here. I do appreciate the opportunity to be asked to speak. I have a lot to say, and they told me 10 minutes to say it, so we'll see how it goes. If you have questions afterwards, after the presentation, or tomorrow, or next week, please don't hesitate to find us, because we'll be happy to answer your question. Let's see if this thing goes. All right, I do want to, before I get too much into projects, I do want to share with you something we hear all the time is why aren't you fixing this road? And within the city of Goldsboro, there are two primary entities that maintain streets. The State Department of Transportation, to my left, and the city of Goldsboro. So as you get into wondering who is doing what, this map is trying to depict that. The green, map, or green lines are DOT streets, the red are city streets, but mostly your main roads, US 70, Spence Avenue, Berkeley Boulevard, Way Memorial, are DOT most of your neighborhood streets are city. That's not perfect, but in generally speaking, that's it. <clears throat> when we talk about street resurfacing, we've never done enough, and they're right. When people say that our streets are in bad shape, they are in many cases, but we have made progress over the last 12 years and done about 20 or 36 miles and about 20% of what we own. So we have done street resurfacing over the years, and more to come this year as we have a contract out for bid uh, or will be out for bid soon to do. And the red here is hard to see, but again, we'll show you spread throughout the city about a half a million dollars of street resurfacing of city streets that's forthcoming in the near future. So I think you'll see that kind of work going on in the coming months. There are a lot of organizations involved in transportation. I don't want to go through what all of these do, but I will tell you it takes team effort and coordination and partnerships, and we talk about it a long time in many cases before it ever happens. So it's a very frustrating process for those that want it to happen right now, because it doesn't work that way. It takes a long time and a lot of entities coming together to get us there. The legal organization for us is the Goldsboro MPO, or Metropolitan Planning Organization, 
And again, they're the primary entity uh, responsible for prioritizing and recommending future needs to the State Department of Transportation. And these exist across the state. This map shows our boundaries. It was just extended due to the census, and it now includes Pikeville. And then the membership is listed in the bottom corner so you know the communities that are involved or the entities involved. And they all have representation on the MPO. We are doing planning or long range planning and this this map shows our transportation plan for the next 20 or 30 years and it can be revised as we go along but we're working towards these lines on a map and today that's what they are they show an identified need as you get closer to the projects and the actual line on the map being built it can shift significantly based on design and environmental issues and of course public comment so again a line on the map doesn't mean it's going to be right there but it does identify the need from point to point the Goldsboro MPO reviews their priorities. This is their current list of priorities from the MPO for our area. And again, we'll work through the process of securing funding and design for these top projects from that long range or that first map that I showed. An ongoing, uh, I guess, land use plan for the city of Goldsboro that the MPO has been involved in, and the MPO is involved because how our land develops really affects transportation, is this land use plan that we've completed and is now out for public comment and a portion of that had a special emphasis on Wayne Memorial Drive from Ash to the new US 70 or NC 44, what it should look like if it were to develop and what the traffic impacts would be if we make changes or leave it like it is or divided medians and those kinds of things. So it's trying to have a special emphasis on areas of concern and we believe, along with many, that Wayne Memorial will have those pressures. There has been at least some concern about zoning. Will this map lead to zoning everywhere that it's shown? And the answer is probably not. Within the city limits or our ETJ, we will likely adjust our current zoning to match what we come up with through this study. Areas outside of the city's control, I would doubt you'll see zoning changes or any zoning in place at this point. But it is trying to look at those areas of special concern as we go forward. There's a lot of information on the MPO on our website. To get there, you start with the city's website. It's goldsboronc.gov. You've got to go to departments, planning, and then you'll find the MPO website. But there's a lot of transportation information there, and I would encourage you to go there as you look through or want to know what's going on related to transportation. I shared this slide, I think, a year ago with local projects. This was 2012. And although we talk about things for a long time, you can see that some on this list are, in fact, complete. So things do get built, and construction does happen after we've talked about it. And again, these are a lot, generally, smaller projects of local interest from turn lanes uh, to widenings in front of the schools to the corridor study that I just mentioned. And again, I just wanted to give you a sort of a sense of we do talk about these projects, but sometimes they do in fact happen. We mentioned uh, the Royal Avenue uh, improvements or widening. Last year I think I talked about it being just at US 70. That is currently ongoing. The utility work started this week, so you're going to have some problems related to us, the city, moving our water line out of the way of the road widening. And then you'll have DOT in there widening the road really to three lanes, so you have a turn lane starting back at Sunburst Drive into North Park and then again continuing on to Berkeley. So that shouldn't, should help significantly along Royal related to the tra uh, traffic light there and traffic from North Park providing that center turn lane that entire length. And that should be completed with Crisco this summer, I think is what Chris told me, but starting in the next months from a construction standpoint and going until it's complete. Berkeley Boulevard is one I spoke to last year. We'd hope to have it in a January letting this year or under construction at this time. The city's the delay in that, trying to purchase the right of way. Uh, we are, have made a lot of offers on property. We will finalize that in the coming months and trying to meet DOT's construction schedule of going to a June letting time frame. So that should be under construction late summer, early fall. And I think you'll see progress where it takes really from Royal Avenue up to New Hope Road and widens Berkeley Boulevard to a four-lane facility the entire length and does some turn laning, which won't solve the traffic problems on Berkeley, but should make it better once it's complete. <clears throat> Sidewalks are part of transportation as well. Um, we listed a projects last year that were important to the city council. I talked about Wayne Memorial Drive from really from Goldsboro High School up to US 70 to be on the top priority. Last year I didn't have money. This year between the state and the city, we do have funding in place for that, and I hope to see construction on that this summer. So we ought to have sidewalks on Wayne Memorial when we're talking about those next year. Probably our next small project related to sidewalks would be Spence Avenue near the railroad track, where you see people walking a lot in the grass. That's another section that is high on our list, and likely our next candidate. Another part of transportation and a lot more emphasis more recently are greenways. Uh, I will tell you, and thank you to the county commissioners, they have applied for a 200,000 trails grant for this on 
to secure money, really taking the New Hope Trail that we have there, continuing it on beyond the church up to Wayne Community College, bringing it back down the sewer easement behind the college and the hospital, and tying it back into Wayne Memorial Drive as well. So you almost end up with a loop in that area with the idea of creating a five-mile loop eventually of our trails in that part of the community and something that many people have gotten very excited about. As well, the city has applied for the same $200,000 grant um, for uh, areas between Stony Creek from Elm, running along the, the Stony Creek uh, stream there, up to Royal Avenue. And again, those projects, if we get those grants, could be under construction in the very near future and then available for us to use. Uh, we've talked about our traffic signal system, a partnership with the Department of Transportation. I have our signal traffic signal guy here, so if you have any real questions or complaints, he's the one. Raise your hand there, Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bobby Croom, I'm delighted to have him uh, on staff. Uh, I'm not sure about the rest of you, but I still get stopped at red lights, and I tell Bobby I don't understand that. Uh, his, his view of what we all want is all green all the time, and he's right. I want it green when I'm coming. I know that's not how it is going to work in the end, but our signals are working together in terms of trying to move traffic, and it is a constant effort and balancing between the side street and the main <coughs> street and progression and time of day. Um, but it's a $4.6 million project, again, a partnership with the Department of Transportation, and I will tell you, we, we are making efforts and improving some parts of the community, and Bobby will continue that effort. Mentioned railroad crossings last year. At that time, the city council was considering re approving a report. At this time, they have approved the report. Uh, this, the basic summary is we would close the Mulberry Street crossing and then various improvements at all of the other crossings from raised medians to striping to signage to gates to flashers to bells, specific to each crossing, so they don't all get all of that. But for all these crossings through the community, it's making it safer for us as citizens crossing the tracks to put money there and make these improvements at these crossings. And I think you'll see those start to happen in the next two to five years. Uh, I don't want to not talk about Union Station or our transfer center. Uh, last year we were applying for grants for Union Station. We did not get those grants. Uh, it's a $10 million project to renovate Union Station, but tied to that is the gateway in the far side of this picture is our gateway bus transfer center, about a $4 million project, 80 to 90 percent federal and state funding, so it does require significant money locally, but it's a good leveraging of our money if, in fact, we can move that project forward. Uh, the Union Station one is probably a little behind that. The gateway transfer station hopefully would be in the, in the coming years. Um, but again, both good projects uh, for our community, and I think you'll see movement on those uh, sometime in the coming years. I think I want to finish with streetscape, and that'll be most of my time today. Uh, again, a year ago we were talking about the first block of doing it. At this point, we have completed the first block. Uh, by and large, the comments have been pretty good. It's still an expensive, expensive project, but I think a good project and a needed project for our downtown. The council did award the engineering services, which is an engineering firm to do the design and a landscape architect to do the, the, the prettiness part of it. Uh, our landscape person is local, so that's a good thing. Our engineer is somebody that has done multiple projects. And with the impact on businesses downtown, I think that's important because it will have a bigger impact on businesses downtown in the next two blocks because there are a lot more of them. The first block we did didn't have a lot of business on it. The next blocks have an awful lot, and so coordination between traffic and pedestrian access will be very important. Uh, the, the top of this slide is what we did in front of City Hall, this first block with parallel parking and a wider median. The bottom of this is what is proposed in the next two blocks, and we'll have some ongoing discussion with the business community. This was a compromise with their concern for loss of parking downtown. The sidewalks would be the same as what you see in front of City Hall on the, or in front of that block in terms of width and parallel parking, but in the, meet, in the center you would have a skinnier median and angled parking so that you have more spaces. And that was a compromise and something we're working towards now. Uh, this was our vision. We've created something similar. I think as it grows into it, you'll see more of that. We've got a few more blocks to do. I would like, if you'll indulge me for a minute on a video, if that will come back, and just show you the progress over six months, May to November, uh, in a minute's time. As this is moving, I will tell you, we had a local firm. You know, we go through a bid process, so we didn't get to pick a local firm, but a local firm was our low bid, and Daniels and & Daniels did an excellent job of taking us through this project and responding to concerns and things that they have come up. And the public comment had been very, very positive since we've completed the project. A lot of concern with holly trees, but most of the holly tree concern, most of the people think we've created something that looks very nice. And so I won't say it's gone, but it has certainly won over a lot of that. Those concerned with the cost, almost $2 million for this block, it's still a concern because money does matter. But I think it's an investment, not maintenance, and it's important for our downtown.
Um, I will show you some completed pictures just so in case you haven't been there. I assume everybody's made it at some point. Uh, but what we talked about, I think we have created. Um, it certainly was nice the night we had our uh, lights up downtown this year. We had a great crowd. We had snow falling. It was fantastic until the snow ran out. Um, and then during our Christmas parade this year, I do think we have the beginnings, again, of a very vibrant downtown. We've had a lot of interest since the project has been completed and folks wanting to move their business downtown. And I will tell you, downtowns matter. Um, I think we heard that, or I know I heard it from our governor recently when he spoke. I heard it from a local person who really wasn't a fan of downtown, but ran into a development investor who said, we were coming to Goldsboro 10 years ago with $10 million investment until we went downtown. And the investment was not downtown, but that was important to that investor that downtown looked like we cared about it. So for those that might think, why are we spending money downtown? Because we believe the same thing, that downtown matters, whether it's for downtown or for the community as a whole. With that, I would thank you for your time this afternoon. If you have questions or comments at any time, information is there, please don't hesitate to find us. And I would uh, encourage you to harass Jennifer and Bobby if you get a chance while they're close by. So thank you for that. Our next speaker is John Rouse. John is a Division Four engineer. He's been based in Wilson. He's been there in the position a couple of years. Uh, he comes from Greenville got extensive background with DOT, and basically the, our relationship with John is we tell him what we want and what our dreams are, and he tells us what reality is and what our needs are. So, but, but John's been great for us and great to work with. Good afternoon. I just briefly want to give you an update on some projects that are going on around Wayne County. We just heard from Scott about the city. But I wanted to bring you up to speed on, again, some projects. And we have a few of them. We've got one great big one, as you know. So I want to bring you up to speed on that. And also a couple of initiatives in the, in the region that are going on as well. Before I get into that, I want to pass on something. When, when Secretary Taylor came on board with the department as our, as our Secretary of Transportation, he made a charge to the department, three things for us to do. There's still a, a culture of customer service in everything that we do and leverage our infrastructure, our transportation infrastructure to create and sustain jobs. We take a hard look at ourselves and the organization and make sure we are as lean and efficient as we can be as a return to the taxpayers. Where's the, okay. First project I want to talk about, a uh, local project, is the uh, Goldsboro Bypass. I'm sure everybody in this room is familiar with it. If you're not, please see me after. <laughs> <laughs> it's a 22-mile uh, bypass of Goldsboro on US 70. It's going to be a four-lane divided freeway facility. It begins just west of NC 581, west of Goldsboro. If you're not, for, not all that familiar with it, on the other side of the Walmart, down near Community Drive. And it goes all the way into Lenore County approximately at the intersection of Promised Land Road before you get to the green. The entire bypass is, again, it's about 22, a little bit over 22 miles in length when it will be completed. And the completion date is late of 2015. So fall 2015, you'll be riding on this facility. Some other local projects, uh, again, this goes for a bypass. It was broken into three sections. There was a center section that was already complete. Uh, that's the section from I-795 to Wayne Memorial Drive. It was open to traffic in December of 2011. I believe it's designated NC-44 right now. That will be changed once the bypass is complete. It'll be renamed US-70. The uh, western section, which we within the department refer to as the A section, uh, from US-70 over to I-795, a contract for that was awarded in uh, July of 2012. That was awarded to the ST Wooten Corporation at a, at a uh, price of $62.4 million. And this is a 5.9 mile section of the road and there will be interchanges constructed at each end of this project at US 70 and, and at NC 581. The uh, project is on schedule and is currently about 17% complete. And again, that, is, that section is slated to be complete late 2015.
The uh, eastern section, a little block anybody as you, uh, is, which is the design build section, stretches from Wayne Memorial Drive to US 70 East back towards Promised Land Road in Lenore County. It's a design bill contract and it was awarded in February of 2012. It is currently in the design and permit acquisition process and we will start breaking ground on the project, actual construction work next month. So you'll, you'll see dust flying shortly. And again, it is also slated to be complete in the summer of 2015. Some other local projects, uh, US 117 North, existing 117, we've got a, a small project to widen it to a three-lane section between Fedland Trail to uh, NC44, which will be the future bypass. And construction on that is scheduled to start in the fall of this year. Another small project we have in the area is uh, Wayne Memorial Drive, uh, widening some of the lanes and paved shoulders from NC44 again to Salston Road. Construction on that will start also this fall. And we also have a project on Wayne Memorial Drive to install traffic signal in left turn lanes at Salston Road, and that's going to commence next month. Everybody's favorite, resurfacing. <coughs> For calendar year 2013, we've, we've already let our resurfacing this year in, uh, in Wayne County. We're going to have 9.1 miles of uh, primary road resurfacing, and that's going to be US 70 from Beston Road all the way to Lenore County, and US 70 westbound lanes only from Lake Lakin Road to Uzzle Road. And the other primary route we're going to be uh, resurfacing this year is NC 55 uh, from the US 70 alternate to NC 43. The uh, primary road resurfacing totaled approximately $1.3 million. We're going to be doing about 17 and a half miles of secondary road resurfacing in Wayne County this year at a cost of $1.2 million. If anybody's interested in a specific route, let me know. I'll be glad to talk to you after, after this. Next, there's a couple of initiatives that are going on. The first one, uh, US 17 South Corridor Feasibility Study. A lot of people refer to this as the extension of I-795. Uh, I know this is something near and dear to a lot of us' hearts in here. Uh, there was a portion of this that was looked at in January of 2004 by the MPO, and that was the uh, basically the extension of US-117, a freeway with uh, interchange access going from where basically I-795 stops now, US-13, all the way down to NC-581. There were 10 alter alternate alternatives looked at, and uh, alternative 10, the last one, was the one that was preferred by the um, Goldsboro MPO. And I believe this was done back in 2004. So obviously, going forward, we need to take a look at that again and, and look at what has changed. Estimated cost in 2004 of this facility, about $125 million. As you know, it's on the uh, east side of town, there's a lot of issues, wetland issues, there's 4F issues, FEMA flood properties. Any of you, I'm sure you remember Hurricane Floyd. That's going to be a, a very costly venture going through that area. Next is uh, the extension of I-795. And let me back up a minute. The, uh, the goal of looking at this study is basically extending I-795 from its existing location all the way down Interstate 40. That is, uh, that's going to be quite an endeavor, as you can imagine. It's going to be done in collaboration with the, uh, with three counties, Wayne County, Duplin County, Sampson County. They have a very small little piece in this as you get down to Interstate 40. Goldsboro MPO, uh, the Eastern Carolina RPO and the Mid-Carolina RPO will also be involved, and two highway divisions. Most of this is in Division 4, some of it is in Division 3 as well. And there's several municipalities along the corridor. Mount Olive, for example, they're going to be heavily involved in, in this as well. We've got to make sure that all the stakeholders are involved in this, and this is a win-win for the municipalities, the county, and the local businesses. We, uh, the projects that we have currently in the uh, spot rankings, there's, there's projects that rank fairly well in the mobility list uh, that will be part of this. One of them is an Oberry, an interchange at Oberry in US 117. 
There's also uh, plans for a uh, interchange at Country Club Drive in US 117. And of course the rest of it will be the improvements of US 117 proper all the way to I-795. There's several sections of that are already partially controlled access. Won't be that hard to do. There are some sections once you get to Mount Olive and south of there that will require a little more work. Let me back up with that. I do want to mention we have we have currently retained funding for the planning and design only of the interchange at O'Berry Road and the interchange at Country Club Road. We have the funds to get them designed and get them shelf ready. We do not have the funds program currently for right of way or construction. The next uh, thing I want to mention to you is something fairly new, uh, interstate connectivity in eastern North Carolina. I know we've talked about it in general for quite a while. Uh, several other municipalities in the area, City of Goldsboro, City of Wilson, City of Greenville, and the City of Kinston, which I'm from. Good to see you, Russell. Have, have met and they have talked about a quad east concept. And what this is is a regional interstate highway network that will connect those four cities and basically surround Greene County. And it will enhance a, a five county area in eastern North Carolina and provide connectivity between those cities. It'll foster regional cooperation and economic development and will greatly enhance mobility and connectivity within the region. This is something very new that's being talked about. I believe the, the municipalities are the ones at this point heading this <coughs> up. Conceptually, this is what you're looking at is, is basically a square loop. Uh, as you see, I-795 is in place. Uh, relatively minor improvements would be needed for US 264 to Greenville. It's already a, a 70 mile per hour freeway. Uh, the Southwest Bypass, south of Greenville, also be another leg of that. And as you can see down here, the blue dotted line, the uh, US 70 Bypass run Goldsboro will be another major part of that. As you get towards Kinston, you could utilize parts of the Felix Harvey Parkway. Obviously, with the Part C extension will be required. And there would be a section of uh, NC11, which a corridor study was, was done, I believe, several years ago, where we looked at potential improvements to that. Again, this is a concept, and this is something that the communities are talking about, and we're at the table listening to and trying to uh, assess their needs. And going forward, we want to make sure that we find a balance. The top industries in our state, and especially in East North Carolina, the military, agriculture, and tourism, we need to make sure we protect those and we foster those with the uh, transportation decisions that we make going forward. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, John, for those excellent presentations. Now, what I'd like to do is uh, take a break for lunch. In just a minute, those doors are going to magically open, and uh, Chairman Steve Keene is going to say grace for us. And then if uh, we'll let everybody get their meal and start eating, and then we'll get Secretary Tate up here to speak to you. Then, Steve, would you say grace, please? Would you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you for the love that you have for us. We thank you for the ability to have the vision that you've enabled us to have. We thank you for this time and fellowship. We thank you for this food and the farms that have produced it for us. We're grateful for the leadership that we have in our state. Father, we ask for your direction, for the, your plan to be unveiled for us and the power that you have to enable us to do that in your presence, Father. Again, we thank you again for this time and fellowship and the safe trips that those have had here. And we just ask you, Father, to grant us safety and uh, keep us safe for the remainder of this evening. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Thank you, Steve. If you would, if the head table would go first. And there's two serving lines so you can get on both sides. We want you to roll. We don't want you to take your time. We don't want you to lollygag. We want to get out of here. And then if you will, Joanna, your table started and just folks fall this way. Seems like to make the most sense to me. All right. Thank you.
doing, man? If I can have your attention, please. In the interest of time, uh, we're going to move forward with the program. Um, if you're eating, continue to eat. Just be quiet. Don't smack and things like that. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to introduce our new um, Secretary of Transportation, Mr. Tata. He was appointed by the governor in January 2013, as you know. And I, I've got his bio here, and I'm not going to read all this because it's, it's long. But he's obviously been very successful. He's a retired from the U.S. Army as a Brigadier General. He brings to his disposition more than three decades of public service as a military officer and public school system leader. He has a history of successfully leading and transforming large, complex organizations with vast responsibilities. It, most recently, some of you might know this, he served as superintendent of Wake County Public Schools, leading the state's largest school district, 18,000 employees, 150,000 students, and probably a time he'd like to forget. That's not on here, though. During his time in the military, General Tata's combat tour, last combat tour was in Afghanistan, where he served as a deputy commanding general of U.S. forces from 2006 to 2007. Throughout his career, he has planned and implemented multiple operations involving complex transportation and infrastructure challenges. I can't even say that. Ranging from multi-mode operations involving ports, airfields, rail, and highways, to designing and implementing extensive infrastructure plans in developing countries. In the last five years, General Taylor has successfully managed large budgets ranging from $4.5 billion and the Department of Defense counter roadside bomb program to the $1.25 billion in Wake County public school system. General Taylor served two tours of duty to the 82nd Airborne Division at Fort Bragg, also served as Brigadier Commander in the 101st Airborne Division and as Deputy Commanding General of the 10th Mountain Division. I'm skipping the rest of this because I'm getting tired. <laughs> Secretary Taylor graduated from the United States Military Academy at West Point with an MA in International Relations at, and also at the Catholic University of America, an NS, MS in Military Art, Science for Strategic Planning, and the School of Advanced, well, I don't know when you've done all this, an Advanced Military Studies, and was a National Security Senior Fellow in the National Security at the Harvard University. I will, this is the easy part. General Taylor, his wife, Jody, Amanda Taylor, have two children, Brooke and Zachary. So I'll let y'all hear Secretary Taylor. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Chuck, for that exhausting introduction. Um, the uh, this whole general thing is way more than it's cracked up to be. Uh, first of all, I was seated at the thing here with two Navy guys, so thank you very much. Um, <laughs> CBs actually, uh, that actually came in handy in Afghanistan, but you know, this, this general thing, um, I, I remember a fight in Afghanistan. Uh, I was a deputy commanding general there, and I had this colonel uh, from Fetville, uh, Ed Reeder. He, he was a special forces commander, and uh, we, this was in Helmand Province, and he and I were watching a big giant screen of the fight going on through the predator feed. Uh, and there, there may be a predator feed over me right now, I don't know. But, um, uh, and 
the you know we're we're looking at each other. We're we're approving. You know, he's asking me, sir, can we drop a bomb on this thing here? And I'm like, yeah, what the heck? Let's do it. And um, uh, actually, it's a very thorough vetting process that, that you go through on that. Um, and finally, this alpha male thing kicks in. We're like, why aren't we down there? Because we're watching our guys fight. And so we get in my helicopter. It's about a three-hour flight to get down there. And the sun's just coming up. And we're talking to the troops. Uh, and it's in Helmand province. And it's poppy fields everywhere. And it was a tough fight all night long. We had some wounded. We were talking to, making sure everything was going all right. And um, as the sun is getting ready to set, the helicopter's coming in. Uh, to pick us up, to pull us out, and uh, everything was in good shape. And so myself and Colonel Reeder and his radio operator and my aide-de-camp are standing in this poppy field with poppy up to about our um, chest high, and Ed, uh, Ed Reeder's radio guy had an intercept capability. And he intercepts an enemy communication that says, um, he says to Ed Reeder, he says, uh, hey, sir, uh, I've got an intercept that says th there's a sniper and he's going to shoot the one without the rifle. And so this is a moment where you just sort of check each other out. And I see Ed and he's got a rifle slung across his uh, body armor. The uh, radio operator's got his rifle and my aide's kind of looking sheepish because he's got his rifle and he forgot to bring mine. And, and, I'm, and I've, I've got my pistol. And, you know, this is the mo kind of moment that defines a man, right? And um, so I'm, I'm looking at Ed, and Ed's looking at me, and he kind of spits into the ground. He says, well, sir, it looks like you're about to have a bad day. <laughs> and, uh, that's what being a general gets you. But uh, then I said, well, Colonel, consider this a direct order to hand over that rifle. <laughs> and, and, uh, we, we both obviously survived that that moment, but uh, um, that, that is a very true story. Um, I'm, I'm really privileged to be here today. Thank you uh, so much for inviting me in. Uh, let's see, um, Sunday and Monday I was down in Florida at a tolling conference. Um, then I flew up Tuesday to D.C. where I briefed our entire uh, del uh, congressional delegation and then Wednesday morning I met with uh, Senator Hagan and uh, Senator Burr's staff, and then Wednesday afternoon I flew into Concord and I went up to Kannapolis and had a um, MPO meeting that I, uh, which I spoke. And I got in late last night and this morning I uh, went out to Smithfield, looked at the bridge being uh, uh, developed there, and then and here I am, and then we're going up to Rocky Mount. So uh, really trying to get out and and do as much as possible uh, to. Uh, really, I'm a tactile uh, leader. I, I'm hands-on in no way, shape, or form. Am I a micromanager? But I got to see things for myself so that I understand them, and I got to talk to the leaders of the communities so that I hear firsthand. Because you know how that filter game goes, and and suddenly when you want X, it becomes Z if it gets uh, translated through several different people. So I, I really appreciate uh, everyone setting this up and allowing me to come in here and, and listen to you. And it was great to hear the two Navy guys talk about their uh, the, the road projects and, and all of that. Uh, and, uh, quite honestly, uh, that was uh, very informative for me. And uh, really, what I thought I would do is for about 10 or 15 minutes, just tell you who I am and, and then uh, kind of what the governor's priorities are. And I, I'm originally uh, from Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm the son of two public school teachers. Uh, my father was a high school football coach, my mother was a guidance counselor, and my dad is finishing up his 15th term in the Virginia General Assembly, so 30 years, and he's, he's mad as heck at me for not moving home and running for his seat. He's done after 30 years, uh, but I said, look, I'm from North Carolina, uh, because I'd spent so much time at Fort Bragg, and then, uh, of course, a couple of years in Wake County. And I consider myself a North Carolinian. Most of my adult life, uh, the, the better portion of it, has been in North Carolina. And my mother served a couple of terms on the Virginia Beach School Board. And uh, I, I mentioned both my parents, A, because they're my role models and continue to be, and B, because this idea of public service is really, uh, I, I get that from them. 
uh, because that's what they've done uh, all of their life. You know, my father's a son of Italian immigrants uh, who you know, my grandfather scratched out a living up in Detroit, Michigan as a brick mason. And, and so understanding where he came from and then seeing, uh, watching him and my mother uh, uh, do what they've done, it certainly has given me um, big, big shoes to fill as one of their three children. And I've got an older brother who unfortunately is a Navy guy also. He went to the Naval Academy. And um, so we have this built-in sibling rivalry and, and a sister. Um, uh, you heard uh, Chuck say I'm, I'm married. Uh, we live in Cary. I've got uh, a daughter who's 24 and at, uh, uh, in Paris, uh, France, getting her PhD in genetics. And um, she just got her master's degree in genetics in uh, uh, December of last year. And it has very little to do with uh, PhD or genetics. It's got everything to do within her high school was a six and a half foot Frenchman that was an exchange student. That, uh, <laughs> um, and so the, the, uh, when she graduated from, she went to the University of Colorado in Boulder um, because it was the most expensive option uh, out there. <laughs> um, the, the, she, uh, um, she had never dated this guy and so I, I get this you know, we're sitting there graduation day and she's like, Dad, you know, just for graduation present, I'd really love to go see Gerald and Friends in France. I'm like, okay, that seems fair enough. They both played tennis. Uh, Gerald was on the boys' tennis team at uh, their high school and, and Brooke was on the girls' team. And so I said, sure. I buy her a ticket and it, the, I suddenly realized that there are no friends, it's just Gerald, because Gerald comes back with her and they started dating. Anyway, my son is uh, in uh, uh, a junior college in Mississippi where he's playing baseball. Uh, every night I get texted uh, stats, and he's the leadoff batter, left fielder for, for this team, and, and uh, he's, he's playing on a scholarship there. So happy children, as we all know, are a good thing. And uh, my, I think uh, everybody in my family is in pretty good shape right now. Uh, through some hard work, but um, so that's personally who I am. I, I graduated from West Point. Um, you know, uh, Scott said earlier, is there another? I asked him where he went to college, and he said NC State. Is there another engineering school? Well, West Point was the first engineering school in the country, and um, it was um, uh, created by George Washington in 1802, specifically to graduate engineers uh, for uh, to build out the new nation. And, and I know Tom Bradshaw would agree with me on that, correct? Right, so, um, and uh, at least I got one person in agreement. Um, and uh, so anyway, uh, the, after graduating from West Point, uh, my version of being a professional athlete was being an infantryman and a paratrooper. And, and uh, I played baseball and wrestled at, at West Point. And um, as uh, my career uh, wore on, uh, certainly the last eight or nine years or so of combat, you were either in combat or preparing for combat, uh, and you know, combat is about 15% getting shot at and about 85% building stuff so that uh, you can uh, improve the lives of the people there. And uh, having been an infantryman, I commanded uh, several different units uh, from when, when I was a lieutenant or a captain all the way up to uh, as the Deputy Commanding General of the uh, 10th Mountain Division, but I commanded a, a paratrooper battalion in the 82nd Airborne Division over here at Fort Bragg, and I commanded a air assault brigade of uh, about 4,500 uh, troopers uh, up at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And in each one of those, I was on operational deployments or combat missions, and, and I always had engineers and military police, and you know, mobility uh, is, is a big deal um, with regard to uh, being in operations and being in combat. And so uh, what I'm leading up to here is when I went and spoke with the governor, um, you know, he, he, I thought I was talking about education position and, you know, he's looking at the backside of my, my resume and, and um, he's seeing all these operational deployments and all the things that you do on an operational deployment, which is build things. Uh, essentially, and so that's how that conversation got started. But in '09, I, I transitioned out of uh, the military, uh, and I remember my parents as teachers, and what a great leave it to beaver idyllic life that uh, we had. 
um, in education with both my parents. Uh, uh, you know, they had summers off and everything was great. And, and we lived in a neighborhood that only teachers could afford, which was not much. And uh, so uh, I said, well, I'll get in this education thing to get back to that nice, peaceful, idyllic uh, life. And uh, uh, so uh, as I'm transitioning out of the military, I, I went through a uh, there's uh, Eli Broad is a, um, a philanthropist that has a foundation for medical science, for arts, and for education. He believes, rightfully in my opinion, that the problem with public education today is uh, leadership at the uh, central office superintendent level uh, because everything emanates downward from there. And so he attacks it from that, you know, Gates attacks it from one direction, smaller schools and that kind of thing. Uh, Broad attacks it from the leadership perspective. And he, he has uh, scouts out at all these, you go through this thing called General Officer Transition Course. And um, so in that, sitting next to me at dinner one night, they had a thing called Nonprofit Night. I recommended you change that name. It's a week long course. and. And I said, look, for people who had been serving in the country, their country for 20, 30, 40 years, nonprofit is not exactly the, the thing they want to be hearing talking about. So they've changed it to social service or social sector night. But anyway, Eli Broad had a, had a recruiter there. And uh, they, they pulled me into that program. And I went through that. And Michelle Ree, who was the chancellor of Washington, D.C. public schools, sits on that board saw my resume and um, yeah, invited me to join her team as they were transforming Washington, D.C. public schools, which was uh, a knife fight every single day. And then I was uh, uh, asked to throw my name in the hat for Wake County Public Schools, and I did so proudly. And, and uh, you know, I don't want to forget a second of that, Chuck, because uh, I'm very proud of everything that we did there and for the first time ever in Wake County Public Schools history, low income students as a subgroup performed above the state average and that's that this past year and that was on the backs of teachers and principals who received more funding if they had more concentrations of, the, of uh, students from low income backgrounds and so uh, the, the gains and accomplishments of, of even for those two years, uh, we are very proud of those and and quite frankly, the, the uh, momentum, hopefully, uh, will, will continue on. And whoever follows uh, uh, me in that superintendent role, I'm hopeful that they will be able to uh, remain creative and innovative and continue to serve all 150,000 and growing students in that system. So that, that led to um, this position with the governor. And I'm proud to serve with our governor. He is, a, he is a great man. He's got a good vision, a great vision for the state. And part of that vision is, uh, as John laid out, um, when he called me um, to offer me the position, um, I was actually surfing in the Dominican Republic. So if you can imagine the uh, juxtaposition of where I was mentally at the time and um, uh, having to think my way through um, uh, what the governor was uh, talking to me about, uh, it, it was quite interesting. And so I'm in the airport uh, in Puerto Rico now because I didn't get the message because uh, I was in flight from one island to the other and um, uh, I was meeting my wife over in uh, San Juan. And um, in the airport in Puerto Rico, there's somebody carrying some chickens around and that kind of thing as they're walking through in the small airplane terminal. and. I'm talking to the governor about being the Secretary of Transportation and, and he says, Tony, I need you to fix DMV and improve customer service throughout the Department of Transportation. The second thing is I want you to uh, find a way to uh, leverage infrastructure creation to create more jobs and sustain more jobs for North Carolinians. And he said, third thing is you know, find a way to be more efficient. It's a 12, 14,000 person organization. See, see where we have overlap and see what you can do to save money and then reinvest that. And that was the broad guidance. And so what we're doing in that regard is um, on the first count, and, and I'm sorry, I don't have PowerPoint or sound effects, but so I'm just sort of talking off of memory here. Um, but on the uh, first point, uh, Division of Motor Vehicles, Improving Customer Service. The, the first week there, um, 
I told uh, my DMV team, I said, the first weekend in March, we will have uh, a Saturday hours office, one of them at least east of 95, one in between 95 and 85, and one west of 85. So I get the first briefing on this, and it, and it shows that program starting in June. And I said, March doesn't start with a J. And, and so then I get the second briefing a couple of weeks later, and it shows it starting in April. And I'm like, March does not start with an A, and do I need to spell it for you? And so uh, tomorrow uh, in Greenville, in North Raleigh, in West Charlotte, there will be um, Saturday DMV hours that we will pilot. And they will uh, be open from 8 to 12. We'll see if that's the right time or not. It needs to be longer or whatever. And then subsequently, each of those offices will start on Monday, and instead of 9 to 5, they'll be 8 to 6. And we're also going to take a look at demand load. Do we have a lot of people coming, you know, standing in line at 7.59 to get in? Well, if, if we do, then we, we slide it to 7. Or do we have a lot of people showing up at, you know, uh, 5.59, and if we do, then we'll slide that to 7, and we'll figure it out. And of course, there's a cost here because it's more personnel hours. And so I've asked them to take a look at how we're going to fund that and, and so forth. But every month, uh, they will add uh, east of 95 and between 95 and 85 and west of 85 a uh, equal number of DMV offices that are open until they hit the standard of which I gave them. I said, uh, it's reasonable to me that 90% of the people in North Carolina are within a one hour drive of a Saturday DMV. Try to hit that standard. And so what they've done is they've drawn a circle and it's about a 50 mile circle on either, so a 100 mile uh, diameter. And so they are putting it on a DMV office, seeing what, how much that covers and they just, uh, and they're about 45 is what they're looking at uh, for Saturday hours and extended hours during the weekday. So that's, that's how, you know, just one sliver of how we're operationalizing the governor's guidance to improve customer service. And some, some offices may be ghost towns, some may be overloaded and will adjust and, and uh, tra transition where, you know, if we need to add more offices in a certain area, we, we will. And, and that's, that's just one way we're doing that. I, on the infrastructure and job creation piece, uh, uh, as uh, John was pointing out, there, there's a, a strategic prioritization of transportation projects, you know, it's called SPOT, and that's that you get a ranking and a number. Does it reduce congestion? Does it um, enhance safety? Does it extend the reach to the rural area? Um, and the bottom consideration is economic competitiveness. And that's, there's a model that is used to uh, calculate how many jobs a specific project will take to actually do, and then the ancillary benefit of second and third order effect of jobs. And so I've asked for something a little more sophisticated and, and to see if we also can't increase the value so it's not the bottom priority, uh, but uh, to see if we might be able to, without risking um, safety or uh, you know, lessening uh, the reduction of congestion or lessening the extension into rural areas, how do we increase the uh, value of economic competitiveness so that we can bring more second and third order impact jobs and you got to look at also the equity formula, which I know everybody is interested in. And so we're reviewing the equity formula and whether or not we can tweak that. And when we put these two things together, these two efforts, uh, and we're, I think uh, we'll uh, brief the governor on it uh, sometime in the next week or two, uh, you can create more projects and you can create more jobs over the life of a 10-year plan. And you know, part of that infrastructure uh, piece is also to, to create a 25-year plan that out, as he did in Charlotte, that outlines the vision uh, with uh, the, the meat to it that tells us what we need. And you know, when we look at our ports and our rail, we, we don't get anywhere near what I think we could get out of our ports 
and our rail for one. And you know, we've got sorry. Uh, two Saturdays ago, uh, I spent uh, the day at Wilmington, and pretty soon I'm going to head out to Moorhead. And and it just to me seems it it seems like we can be far more strategic and far more um, uh, mindful of the impact that we can have. And one small example is, uh, yeah, when my first week I said, okay, where's some low-hanging fruit? I've been around bureaucracies long enough uh, that I know that there's been something that's been punted around here forever. And so they brought me like, you know, 10 things. And um, I said, well, you know, let me take on the first few. And uh, one of them was, uh, you may have heard that we've recently approved a uh, public-private partnership for a refrigeration facility inside the port of Wilmington. Uh, you know, the North Carolina is number two in the nation in poultry and pork production. You just saw agriculture as one of our top three businesses. And, uh, and in commerce, and so the majority of our poultry and pork farmers send their product to Hampton Roads or Charleston, and that's hundreds of extra miles driven in each direction, and it's also port uh, and taxes and fees that we're not making here in North Carolina, and it makes no sense to me since we got two great ports um, why we didn't have that already approved. And when I think of now that we've got this approved and this businessman has got the funding and, and uh, they're, they're going to do this, he says, within about a year, uh, I think of all of the hundreds of miles that each truck will save each way uh, every, every time they drive and all of the money, the fuel, the maintenance that it takes, that that farmer will now be able to re reinvest in his or her business and the jobs that will come out of that or the higher wages that will come out of that. And, and so that's just one small example. There are other things. We're talking wood pellets, of course, and I know there's some controversy around that, but you know, Europe uses that as a major fuel. And when I talk to Commissioner Troxler, you know, the, the timber industry is very interested in this. And so it's another uh, project that was on that list of 10 things that have been punted around for a while and so we're, we're trying to move out on that as well and uh, you got when you talk ports um, you've got Panamax now um, uh, you know they require 54 feet of draft uh, because they're widening the Panama Canal and one-third of the tankers that are already out there are too big for our two ports and we've got about 45 feet of draft at uh, in the Cape Fear and then we got about 47 at Moorhead so we got some work to do just to compete, or do we uh, look at you know different markets? And we've had both of those discussions. Uh, Moorhead's about two to three miles from Blue Water, and, and uh, Wilmington's uh, seven or eight miles from from Blue Water. And and so we've got to we got to figure out how we're going to move forward economically there. But I think if we can crack that nut. You backward map in, into Goldsboro here and, and other areas, and then I think you really begin to, to get some momentum uh, that uh, we don't have right now, even though we have good momentum in other areas. So that's, that's just one example of the infrastructure to create jobs. That, that refrigeration facility alone creates 300 jobs. And, and so uh, to build it and then to sustain it. So that, that's uh, one example. There are others. and. Uh, then, of course, to be more efficient, we've already handed over a number of jobs uh, to the budget director that, you know, I, I've got uh, hundreds of jobs that are vacant right now and have been vacant for years, and I'm like, okay, we're doing all right, and so let's, let's just turn that over and, and be more efficient and use that money for something else or turn it in as savings, and so we've, we've begun that process, and we took a 2% cut and we turn that over as well to the budget director and tomorrow is the day I believe today or tomorrow is the day that our budget is shrink wrapped with the governor and he submits it uh, to the General Assembly so that's uh, already and and then in my first I'm not even on the job two months we've had three major ice or snow events and and I congratulate all the division engineers for getting out there and doing everything they can to make our roads uh, safe 
but as, as you can see, this is a daily um, endeavor. Uh, there's ongoing operations every single day, and our division engineers are really carrying the, the heavy, heavy load, and I thank John for all of his hard work here in this uh, division. And so the, I'll wrap it up by saying I am very proud to be your secretary. And I think what you will find is that I will be a very hardworking public servant who will listen very intently to what it is that uh, you need. Each and every area I, I visit needs. I will, I will take notes, uh, or Ashley will take notes, and, and I will try to remember everything, and she will remind me if I don't, that's for sure. And um, we will all work together to make a uh, better North Carolina. So thank you very much for your attention today, and I hope, Chuck, I didn't talk too long. So thank you very much. Okay, folks, it's 1.25. We want to be gone at 1.30. Does anybody have any burning questions? You've got a lot of knowledge and experience. Does anybody have any questions that you need answered publicly? Yeah, well, I forgot this. So I'll take questions. Does, does anybody have and be, <coughs> any questions? Well, if not, let's give these folks a round of applause for all they've done. <laughs> and once again, I do want to thank everybody, because transportation is about commerce. It is about jobs. You've heard that today. And thank you so much, and hopefully you can take this message further into the community. I know about the gifts. <laughs> Golly. I got to 1.30. All right. Well, we, we do have two gifts. We're going to give our two, two of our speakers one. Uh, anyway, we'll, we'll do that. And thank you all for coming. Please have a great day. Thank you.